trigeminal nerve is by far the most important part of this presentation. You'll see in parentheses it says CNV. That stands for cranial nerve 5 because the cranial nerves are known by both name and Roman numeral. And when we try to put a V using a word, I mean a Roman numeral 5 using a word processor, it comes out looking like a V. This is the largest of the 12 cranial nerves and it's the most important one to us. It's considered to be a mixed nerve because it has both sensory and motor fibers. You'll recall that sensory fibers are those which send information toward the central nervous system and motor fibers are those which send information away from the central nervous system. The sensory fibers of the trigeminal nerve provide information to our brain from our teeth, mucous membranes, and the skin of our face and motor information to move the muscles of mastication. This picture shows you the scope of the trigeminal nerve and I'd like to call your attention to this area right here. This is called the trigeminal ganglion. These are the originating cell bodies of the trigeminal nerve and you'll notice there are three main trunks to it. So sensory information is coming from these areas heading toward the brain through the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and the mandibular nerve. And motor information is coming from the trigeminal ganglion outwardly to the muscles of mastication. The ophthalmic division is sensory only and it's known as V1. It exits the skull through the superior orbital fissure and it might be helpful to just recall that we visit an ophthalmologist to get our eyes examined. So here we see something to do with the eye. The maxillary nerve, or V2, is also sensory fibers only. Its exit point is the foramen rotundum. And the last division, the mandibular, or V3, is the only one of the three branches which is a mixed nerve. That means it has both sensory and motor fibers. Its point of exit is the foramen ovale. This picture shows you the direction that each of these three nerves heads, so you can see the difference between the areas served by the three. And this also gives you an indication of the area of service for the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and the mandibular nerves. As I mentioned, the point of origin for this nerve is from a ganglion. The ganglion is located on the ventral or underneath surface of the cerebral pons. It is known either as the trigeminal ganglion or the semilunar ganglion. Gasserian happens to be older terminology. It divides into the three branches that I showed you and it's important to remember that only the mandibular division contains motor fibers. Here's a picture of the inside of the skull. This would be the trigeminal ganglion. This is the ophthalmic nerve headed toward the superior orbital fissure. The maxillary nerve headed to the foramen rotundum and the mandibular nerve headed to the foramen ovale. I think it's important for you to remember maxillary goes through rotundum, mandibular goes through ovale. The ophthalmic division is the smallest and as I mentioned exits the superior orbital fissure. It has three main branches which are called nasociliary, frontal, and lacrimal. Basically those three nerves send sensory information from the structures you see listed here. The eyeball, the conjunctiva of, conjunctiva of the eye are lacrimal glands, mucous membranes of our nose are ethmoid and sphenoid sinuses, the skin of our forehead, our eyelids, and our nose. This is the scope of the ophthalmic nerve when you look at it from the side. Here's where it leads through the superior orbital fissure heading upward toward the eyeball. This is what it looks like from the front exiting the superior orbital fissure, sending a branch laterally toward the lacrimal gland, upward toward the forehead, and medially toward the skin of the nose. Here's the scope of the ophthalmic nerve and again the trigeminal ganglion and how the nerve exits in the back exits and heads toward the eyeball. This is one of three charts that I have constructed for you. You can download them as a Word document from the Blackboard site. Each of them is set up to show you the name of the nerve, what type of nerve it is, its exit point, and its main branches. Underneath each main branch you see the structures that these branches are responsible for sending messages to or from.
The maxillary nerve is a sensory nerve only. It's sending information from our maxillary teeth, the bone which holds those teeth in, as well as our hard palate, the periodontal structures, and the associated soft tissues. It also sends sensory information from the mucous membranes of the maxillary sinus, the nasopharynx, and part of the tonsillar area, as well as the bone and tissues of the hard and soft palate, and the skin of the lower eyelid, the upper lip, and the side of our nose. It's important to recognize this last fact because when we give certain types of injection, the injections on the maxilla, our, not only will our patient's teeth and tissues be numb, but we may have num numbing in the lower eyelid, the upper lip, and the side of the nose. Here's the maxillary nerve, leaving the foramen rotundum. It has an area that serves the zygoma and a piece of the temporal region. It has a branch called the posterior superior alveolar heading down toward the molars. It has a branch known as the infraorbital. This is the piece that enters the back of our eye through the inferior orbital fissure, runs along the floor, and enters the infraorbital canal, which is what you see listed right here. While it's in that canal, it sends two branches downward toward the rest of our teeth, the middle and anterior superior alveolar branches, while the end of it comes out of our infraorbital foramen. It also has five branches which come down through the pterygopalatine fossa right here, and three of them end up inside the oral cavity, the nasopalatine, greater palatine, and lesser palatine. As I mentioned, the maxillary nerve leaves through the foramen rotundum and enters what is called the pterygopalatine fossa, where it divides into its main branches. If you look on page 180 of your text, you'll see a very nice summary of these branches and where they go to. The pterygopalatine branches are two short trunks of the maxillary nerve that pass through a collection of nerve fibers that actually belong to the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. Those are parasympathetic fibers supplying information from the facial nerve. The maxillary nerve isn't really involved in those fibers, they just have to happen to anatomically pass through them. On the other side of that ganglion, there are five branches that belong to the maxillary nerve. You see them listed here. The first and the last don't concern us in the realm of anesthesia. It's the nasopalatine, greater palatine, and lesser palatine that we need to take a close look at. So here's the maxillary nerve leaving the foramen rotundum, and this is the pterygopalatine fossa. This little round body that you see here is the pterygopalatine ganglion, and it's from this point that those five branches leave and go in different directions. The lateral nasal heading toward the mucosa on the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. <clears throat> the nasopalatine heading down toward the floor of the nose. The greater palatine and lesser palatine heading toward the oral cavity. Let's take a closer look at the nasopalatine nerve. The nasopalatine nerve goes into the nose through an opening called the sphenopalatine foramen where it goes across the roof, travels down the septum in the middle, and then hits the floor of the nasal cavity. When it gets to the floor of the nasal cavity, there's an opening called the incisive canal. The other end of that opening is the incisive foramen, which in your patients is covered with tissue we call the incisive papilla. It's important to recognize that the right and left nasopalatine nerves are entering the oral cavity through the same opening, or through the incisive foramen. The nasopalatine nerve is responsible for sending sensory information from the mucous membranes and lingual gingiva of the region we call the premaxilla. So here's a diagram. Pterygopalatine fossa. Nasopalatine nerve entering the nasal cavity, traveling al along the roof, across the nasal septum, and down to the floor of the nose. This is the incisive canal where the nerve enters the mouth through the incisive foramen and travels in an anterior direction. It's easier, I think, if you'll remember that the front part of your hard palate is the piece closest to your nose, hence that's why this nerve is called nasopalatine, or the part of the palate that's closest to the front part of your nose. Here you're looking at the place where the right and left nasopalatine nerves come out of the incisive foramen. This is the area called the premaxilla. So when you put your roadblock right here at the incisive papilla or underneath the tissues of it, you are blocking information 
coming from any of these fibers. The patient will feel numb on the hard palate and the lingual tissues from canine to canine. Let me point, point out that the, at no point does this nerve enter the bone so that it can reach the apices of these teeth. So the nasopalatine nerve is responsible for only the lingual tissues involved in these teeth. The pulp chamber of the teeth and the buccal tissues over these teeth are served by a different nerve altogether. The greater palatine nerve descends through the pterygopalatine canal. The other end of that canal is the greater and lesser palatine foramen. So the greater palatine nerve comes into the mouth at the greater palatine foramen, which is located about one centimeter toward the palatal midline just distal to the second molar, or three to four millimeters in front of the border between the hard and soft palate, which in most people is in easy to distinguish because there's a color change in the tissues. Sensory information from the greater palatine nerve comes from the palatal soft tissue and the bone underneath it all the way up to the first premolar. But in many patients, there's a communication with the terminal branches between the greater palatine nerve and the nasopalatine nerve. I'll explain that in just a moment. Here's the greater palatine nerve coming through the greater palatine, the pterygopalatine ganglion, entering the pterygopalatine canal where it comes out into the mouth at the greater palatine foramen and runs in an anterior direction, sending sensory information from the soft tissue and the bone underlying that soft tissue, from the region of the first premolar all the way back to the end of the hard palate. Here's that diagram we looked at earlier. The nerve you see in white is the greater palatine nerve. What I meant by these two nerves communicating is just this. Sometimes we put our anesthesia here, we expect the patient to be numb as far forward as the first premolar. They may only be numb as far forward as the second premolar. That may be because the first premolar or the lingual tissues here send sensory information to the brain via the nasopalatine nerve instead of the greater palatine nerve. Another thing that I'd like to point out is that if you provide your patient with a greater palatine nerve block on the right, and a nasopalatine nerve block, they will feel no lingual tissues from the last molar all the way to the canine on the opposite side of the mouth. This entire region should be anesthetized. In this diagram, it shows you the scope of the greater palatine nerve, so sensory information from this does not go to the brain. Just like the nasopalatine nerve, though this is soft tissue and the bone in this region only, the pulp chambers of these teeth and the buccal soft tissues get their sensory information to the brain through another nerve. I'd also like to use this picture to point out the fact that the greater palatine foramen is anatomically located very close to the lesser palatine foramen. Remember, we're putting anesthetic here. An anesthetic can diffuse, go from an area where we put a whole lot of it to an area where there isn't much of it. That means it can diffuse toward this foramen or away from the foramen in a backwards direction. And we could possibly block off information from the lesser palatine nerve. So let's look at why that's important. The lesser palatine nerve, as I just pointed out, um, comes out into the mouth just behind or posterior to the greater palatine nerve. The fibers are running in a posterior direction and sending information from the soft palate and palatine tonsils. If we block off that sensory information, the patient won't be able to feel the soft palate. In some people, this means that they might feel a little anxious or panicky because they'll feel like they can't swallow. It's important for you to know that they can swallow. If they feel sensory anesthesia, we have not blocked off the motor information. It takes an awful lot of anesthetic to block off motor nerve fibers. The patient can still use the muscles to swallow, they just can't feel it when they do swallow. The zygomatic nerve is also a branch of the maxillary nerve that travels in an anterior direction and enters the eye orbit through the inferior orbital fissure. It has two main branches called the zygomatical facial and the zygomatical temporal. The facial nerve sends information from the cheek and the temporal nerve sends information from the temporal region. Here's the maxillary nerve zygomatical facial comes down and sends information here 
the temporal nerve or zygomatical temporal nerve sends information from the temporal region. The posterior superior alveolar nerve is very important to us. It has, <coughs> or in some individuals, can have two trunks. One will enter the bone through the posterior superior alveolar foramina and the other will stay external, providing information from soft tissues. The sensory information provided to the brain through this nerve you see listed here. The back wall of the maxillary sinus, the pulp, buccal bone, buccal gingiva, and periodontal ligaments of the maxillary molars, with the exception of the mesial buccal root of the maxillary first molar. Let's take a look. Here's the maxillary nerve. It's important that you understand the PSA is a direct branch off of the maxillary nerve. It runs in a downward direction and enters the infratemporal surface of the maxilla up above the maxillary tuberosity. It enters little tiny openings right here called the PSA foramina. I keep saying it enters because it's important for you to remember in order for a nerve to reach the apex and then get to the pulp chamber of these teeth it has to go inside the bone where we find that apex in the first place. Here's the maxillary nerve and the direct branch called the PSA. It has fibers that enter the bone through small openings back here and then send information individually to the three molars. You'll notice that this area is a different color and that's because in many patients the mesial buccal root of this first molar is supplied through another nerve, the middle superior alveolar nerve. This is the area served by the PSA and I'd like to point out when you hear the word alveolar that means it's a nerve that is entering the bone and the only way to get at the root of the tooth and therefore the pulp chamber is to enter the bone. So all of the nerves that supp supply information regarding pulp chambers of our teeth end in the word alveolar. So we have posterior, middle, and anterior alveolar nerves. Each, ner each tooth has what is called a dental plexus. These are small sensory endings that lead to larger nerves that supply the individual roots, bone, and periodontal structures for each of our teeth. Each tooth has a dental nerve and an interdental nerve. The dental nerve is what sp supplies sensory information from the pulp chamber itself. The interdental nerve is what supplies information from the alveolar bone, the periodontal ligaments, the papilla, and the buccal gingiva. If a tooth is a multi-rooted tooth, it will also have what is called an interradicular nerve, which sends information from the bone and the periofibers in a multi-rooted tooth. Why is this important? Well, it's important to understand for example, that this tooth has a dental plexus. There are individual fibers that send sensory information from the buccal tissues and the periodontal ligament space underneath. And there's, an, there's a sensory fiber going into the apex of this tooth, sending information from the pulp chamber. If we set our roadblock up to block only the dental plexus serving this tooth, we will have a small zone of anesthesia. Only this tooth will be anesthetized. When we place our anesthetic higher up and closer to the central nervous system, we may be blocking off the dental plexus from several teeth. That's what we call a block injection. So if we block up here or put our roadblock up here, the dental plexus serving this tooth, this tooth, and this tooth won't get beyond our roadblock. The infraorbital nerve is very important. It enters the eye orbit through the inferior orbital fissure goes along the floor of the orbit through something called the infraorbital groove and enters an infraorbital canal. While it's in that canal, it gives off two branches that run in a downward direction. Those two branches are the anterior and middle superior alveolar nerves. So you will see here again we see the word alveolar. Whenever we see alveolar we know that that nerve is headed toward the pulp chamber of the tooth. We see the word superior, so that tells us our upper arch, or our upper alveolar processes. And here we see anterior, going to our anterior teeth, and middle, going to the teeth in between our anteriors and our molars. ASA and MSA are branches of the infraorbital nerve. Very important for you to remember that. 
because if we set our roadblock up to block off the entire infraorbital nerve, no messages coming from either the ASA or the MSA will be brought to the brain. In other words, you have the message has to travel from the ASA to the infraorbital to the maxillary to the brain. If you set up a roadblock to just block off the dental plexus, only the tooth receiving information from those nerves will have an anesthesia. If you set your roadblock up to block off the entire nerve trunk, whatever is served by that trunk will be anesthetized. And since the ASA and MSA are branches of the infraorbital, blocking the infraorbital blocks the ASA and the MSA at the same time. This is the area of anesthesia from the infraorbital nerve. Here is the inferior orbital fissure. The nerve enters this infraorbital groove and right here there's an opening. So there is a canal or channel of bone between my, where my cursor is pointing and this foramen, foramen, which is called the infraorbital foramen. It is in this channel of bone or the infraorbital canal where the middle and the anterior nerves travel down off the infraorbital nerve. If we place our anesthesia at the infraorbital foramen, the information coming toward that foramen from the anterior and middle nerves will not get by our roadblock. Therefore, you see, when we block the infraorbital nerve, we're blocking middle and anterior branches all at the same time. So the pulp chambers and the buccal tissues from the central all the way back to the mesial buccal root of the first molar will not receive information, not, nor will the soft tissues in this entire area, lower eyelid, side of the nose, and the upper lip. The middle superior alveolar again you see alveolar remember it's headed into the bone if it's headed into the bone it's headed to the pulp chamber here we're talking about our upper arch and the teeth in the middle as I mentioned it comes down through the maxillary sinus on its way to these teeth so sensory information from the middle part of the maxillary sinus is sent to the brain through the MSA it is headed to the pulp chamber, the buccal bone, and the buccal gingiva of our maxillary premolars and the mesial buccal root of our maxillary first molar. There's a fair number of people in whom this nerve may actually be a absent. In other words, they may have just a PSA and an ASA. Here's a diagram showing the PSA headed to the two molars, the, um, excuse me, the three molars except for the mesial buccal root of the first the infraorbital nerve and its two branches, ASA and MSA. The MSA provides sensory information from the mesial buccal root of the first molar, the second premolar, and the first premolar. This is just another diagram showing you those two teeth and the mesial buccal root of the first. This is the area of innervation for the middle superior alveolar nerve. You'll notice that in, unlike the other diagram, only this area is grayed out. That's because it is possible to place anesthesia high enough up against the wall of the maxillary bone and that anesthesia will diffuse through the bone on the maxilla, blocking off the nerve trunk right here. It's also possible to place the anesthetic right here and block off the ASA. By putting the anesthesia up further and closer to the central nervous system, we would block both the ASA and the MSA. The anterior superior alveolar nerve, as I just mentioned, is very similar to the MSA in that it comes through the maxillary sinus, but it, it descends in a more anterior direction. So just like the MSA, it does provide sensory information from the maxillary sinus, but the anterior region of that sinus. It also provides sensory information from the pulp, buccal bone, buccal gingiva of our maxillary anterior teeth. Just like the other diagram, you see the two branches, MSA and ASA, branches of the infraorbital. This time we're headed toward the anteriors. So just to recap, I think it's easy to, to keep this all straight in your mind. If you think about, I'm trying to get the tooth it numb, I have to get at the tooth where it is, it is sitting, and it is sitting in the alveolar bone. So the nerve has to have the name alveola in it in order for me to get anesthesia of the pulp chamber. Now which arch am I headed for? Well, I'm headed for the maxilla, so it has to have the name superior in it.
which region of the maxilla am I headed for? Am I headed for the anterior or the posterior or somewhere in between or in the middle? This is the scope or zone of anesthesia for the anterior superior alveolar nerve. Notice at no time did I mention the lingual of the maxilla. Oops, before I get there, let me go here. Terminal branches of the infraorbital nerve. That means where does this nerve end? Well, the infraorbital nerve ends by exiting out of the bone through the infraorbital foramen. When it comes out that foramen, it gives off three terminal branches. The inferior palpebral, headed for the skin of the lower eyelid, the external nasal, headed for the skin on the side of the nose, and the superior labial, headed for the skin and mucous membranes of the upper lip. And again, if we're blocking off the infraorbital nerve, any of its branches are not going to be able to send information to the brain. So when we give an I.O. block, our patient will not feel their upper lip, the skin on the side of their nose, or the skin of their lower eyelid. This is to recap the maxillary nerve supply and what's Im most important for you to understand in administering anesthesia to the maxilla. As I've mentioned, you're looking for the word alveola, alveolar if you're looking to anesthetize pulp. And whenever you anesthetize the pulp, you are also going to get anesthesia of the buccal bone and the buccal soft tissues. So if you want buccal anesthesia, you need a nerve that says alveolar. If you want the molars, you want a nerve that says posterior superior alveolar, but you have to remember you may not have anesthesia of the mesial buccal root. If you want the premolars, it's the middle superior nerve you're looking for. If you want the anteriors, it's the anterior superior nerve. Both of these are a branch of that. So if you want anesthesia of the pulp chambers of your maxillary teeth, you can give an infraorbital block and get anesthesia from the central all the way back to the mesial buccal root of the first molar, and then you can block the posterior superior alveolar nerve and get anesthesia of the remainder of the pulp chamber and the buccal tissues. In order to get anesthesia of the palatal or lingual tissues, you need to block both the greater palatine and the nasopalatine nerves. This is the chart that will show you the scope of the maxillary nerve which leads through the foramen rotundum. You have the zygomatic branches, you have the pterygopalatine branches passing through that fossa. You have five branches that come off. The three in the middle are the three that are the most important to you. Listed under each branch, it shows you the area of sensory information provided by that branch and some information about how it gets to the oral cavity. You have the PSA as a separate branch by itself in the area it supplies. And lastly, you have the infraorbital nerve, which has two critical branches for us, the MSA and the ASA. And you see those two branches listed here in the areas that they supply as well as the terminal branches of the I.O. So remember, putting your roadblock up here turns off the information from this entire area. Putting your roadblock here will not block that or this. Putting your roadblock here will only block this. This is a schematic which basically has a diagram showing you what those branches are, what their names are, how they come off the maxillary nerve. You could take this diagram and write underneath what is supplied by each of these branches. Some hints for remembering. I've stressed so far that it's important to remember if a nerve exits a foramen, it's sending information from soft tissues. In order to send information from the pulp and the bone and the periodontal structures, it has to enter the bone in order to do so. The mandibular nerve, or V3, is the largest division and the only one which is mixed. It has a very large sensory root and a small motor root. Its point of exit is the foramen ov ovale, important for you to remember. Here's the scope of the mandibular nerve. You'll notice that it has one branch that actually goes in an upward direction. This is the auriculotemporal nerve. The rest of the mandibular nerve heads downward toward the mandible. Anatomically, you need to understand that the mandibular nerve contains both sensory and motor nerve fibers that are actually running together in a common nerve trunk just after it leaves the foramen ovale.
and off of this common trunk it gives two branches one is called the men meningeal and it's he actually headed upward toward the brain to provide sensory information from our meninges it also has um, a few small motor branches one bringing information to the t me excuse me medial pterygoid muscle and two of the tensor muscles in our oropharynx or our soft palate after the common trunk it divides into two divisions a small anterior division and a larger posterior division this is only an anatomical division this really doesn't have anything to do with the function or physiology of the nerve it's just that anatomically one part of it goes forward and one part of it goes backward the part that goes forward is smaller and contains one afferent or sensory branch called the long buckle which is very important to us it also contains three efferent or motor branches that go to the remaining muscles of mastication the large posterior division is just the opposite it contains three afferent or three sensory branches going to our tongue our TMJ and our mandibular teeth and one efferent branch or motor branch that goes to the mylohyoid muscle and the anterior belly of the digastric muscle this will show you schematically what you see colored in orange here are considered to be the branches that belong to the anterior division of the mandibular nerve. The medial pterygoid nerve and the meningeal nerve leave the common trunk up here. This, so this little piece right here is called the common trunk. It is at this point that the trunk, um, excuse me, the mandibular nerve splits up into the anterior division and the posterior division, which is what you see grayed out here in its much larger scope. So just remember that the mandibular nerve is the nerve that supplies motor movement to the muscles of mastication via the deep temporal nerves, the lateral pterygoid nerve, the masseteric nerve going to the masseter muscle, and the medial pterygoid nerve going to the medial pterygoid muscle. The only sensory branch of the anterior division is the buccal or long buccal nerve. It starts off on the inside of the mandible, which you would normally see the mandible in place here, crosses over that mandible and ends up inside your buccinator muscle. This is the posterior division of the mandibular nerve. You'll see it's much larger. It has a sensory branch headed up toward the temporal region. This is called the auriculotemporal nerve. The remainder of the nerve goes in a downward direction headed toward the mandible. This is just a recap of the efferent or motor branches of the anterior division. The long buccal nerve is very important nerve for you to understand because you're going to learn how to give a long buccal or a buccal nerve block. This nerve anatomically passes between the two heads of our lateral pterygoid muscle and comes in a downward and forward direction on the medial or inside of the mandible. So it's important for you to recognize the nerve is starting off on the inside of the mandible and ends up crossing over the mandible and coming to the outside where it's headed to the buccinator muscle. It does not supply any information to the buccinator muscle or to help that muscle move around. The facial nerve does that. So the buccinator muscle is moved by the facial nerve, not the mandibular nerve. But the fibers from it, the fibers from the long buccal nerve, end up inside the buccinator muscle. Here's again that diagram showing you the nerve on the inside of the mandible and crossing over because this is on the outside of the mandible. This, I think, shows you what you really need to understand. The long buccal nerve coming down on the inside, that's why you can't see it here, just posterior to the last tooth present, slightly below the coronoid notch of the mandible, it crosses over <clears throat> and comes down along the buccal surface of the mandibular molars. And this is the piece of information that's most critical for you to understand. If you set a roadblock up right here, the sensory information from the buccal tissues over the, our mandibular molars will not get beyond our nerve um, block. In most cases, whatever nerve supplies information to the pulp chambers of our teeth also supplies information from the buccal gingival tissues. This is the exception to the rule. The buccal gingival tissues from the um, first molar backward is not sent from the inferior alveolar nerve it's sent from the buccal nerve. So if we block the inferior alveolar nerve, 
Our patient will not be able to feel the pulp chambers of these teeth, but they will be able to feel the soft tissues in this region. So in order for them to not feel information from both the teeth and the tissues in the molar region, we have to block both the inferior alveolar nerve and the long buccal nerve. This is the area supplied by the long buckle. The long buckle sends information from the soft tissues only. The information from the pulp chambers of these teeth is provided by the inferior alveolar nerve. This is just a recap of the information sent to the brain through the long buccal nerve. The skin of our cheek are buccal mucous membranes in the more posterior region, but most important, the buccal gingiva of our mandibular molars. As I mentioned, the posterior division of the mandibular nerve has three afferent branches called the auriculotemporal, the lingual, and in the inferior alveolar. It has one efferent branch that goes to the mylohyoid nerve and actually a smaller one that goes to the anterior belly of the digastric. This is the one that's important for you to remember. The auriculotemporal nerve is not anything that we anesthetize. Um, you just need to remember it's a sensory branch from the mandibular nerve. It is providing information from the parotid gland, the TMJ, and the skin of our ear and our temporal region. The lingual nerve is a nerve that's very important for you to recognize. It runs in a downward and forward direction, again on the inside of the mandible, and it's anatomically located just in front of and a little bit medial or closest to the midline in regards to the inferior alveolar nerve. Oftentimes, when we're blocking the inferior alveolar nerve, even if we don't want to block the lingual nerve, we'll get that to happen anyway. But most of the time when we're doing anesthesia for dental hygiene, we want the lingual nerve to be blocked. So you'll be learning the technique to get anesthesia of both the inferior alveolar nerve and the lingual nerve at the same time. The second piece of information that's important for you to understand is the fibers from the lingual nerve at some point actually join together with a branch of the facial nerve called the corda tympani. These fibers are intertwined and when we anesthetize the lingual nerve we may also get anesthesia of the facial nerve at that point. The lingual nerve enters the mouth at the base of the tongue. It gives off branches that enter the floor of the mouth as well as the body of the tongue some branches that enter the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands and it ends in the lingual gingiva of our mandible. This is the part that's most important for you to understand. These are sensory fibers sending information from our patient's lingual gingiva. That information is traveling up to the brain through the lingual nerve. You'll notice that this nerve is located in front of the inferior alveolar nerve. This is the inferior alveolar nerve entering the mandible at the mandibular foramen. This is the long buccal nerve, which is even more anterior to the lingual nerve and much higher up, coming down across the ramus of the mandible and going over onto the outside or lateral surface of the mandible. When we put our roadblock here at the inferior, um, excuse me, at the mandibular foramen, the anesthetic may diffuse in a forward and medial direction blocking off the lingual nerve. So sometimes we kill two birds with one stone. But if we definitely want anesthesia of the lingual nerve, we have to deposit some anesthetic here, withdraw our needle and redirect it in a more medial direction to get anesthesia of the lingual nerve. So just remember when we set a roadblock up here, no information from the lingual soft tissues is going to get beyond our roadblock. This is a picture that shows you where the corda tympani branch of the facial nerve and the lingual nerve, the fibers are intertwined. The facial nerve or corda tympani nerve is sending messages from this vicinity as well as the lingual nerve. So they're sending information, just different kinds of information. When we block the lingual nerve, we may also be blocking off the facial nerve. So what exactly does the lingual nerve provide information from? Very important for you to recognize that the sensation, general sensation from the body of the tongue or the anterior two-thirds of our tongue is provided to our brain through the lingual nerve. So if we block the lingual nerve to get anesthesia of the lingual gingiva of our mandibular teeth, our patient also will not be able to feel their tongue. 
They also won't be able to feel information from the submandibular or sublingual salivary glands or the mucosa of the floor of the mouth. The inferior alveolar nerve. Let's take a look at this word. Here again we see the word alveolar. When we see alveolar we need to think this nerve is going into the bone to reach the pulp chambers of our teeth. And which teeth are we talking about? We're talking about the lower teeth, the inferior jaw, which is our mandible. As I showed you in the earlier picture, this inferior alveolar nerve is headed downward and forward and headed for the mandibular foramen. It passes between the sphenomandibular ligament and the medial aspect of our ramus. It is located anatomically, lateral and posterior to our ling lingual nerve. It enters the mandible at the mandibular foramen and travels underneath the roots of our mandibular molars and premolars through a structure called the mandibular canal. It's also important for you to recognize that the inferior alveolar artery and vein are also entering the mandibular foramen at the same time as the IA nerve. That's why the IA injection carries one of the highest rates of positive aspiration. Important to remember, two blood vessels as well as the IA nerve are using the same opening, and that is our target site or our site of deposition for an IA nerve block. The inferior alveolar nerve runs from the mandibular foramen through the mandibular canal and ends at the mental foramen. When it gets to the mental foramen, it splits into two branches. They're called the mental nerve and the incisive nerve. So keep in mind, the incisive nerve and the mental nerve are branches of the IA nerve. So if we block the IA nerve, no information from either the incisive nerve or the mental nerve is going to get beyond our roadblock. Here's the inferior alveolar nerve entering the mandibular bone right here at the mandibular foramen. This is the mandibular canal through which the nerve runs and sends up a plexus to these teeth. Anatomically, the inferior alveolar nerve is considered to reach its end point when it reaches the mental foramen. Again, here's another diagram, mandibular foramen, mandibular canal. All of this is considered to be the inferior alveolar nerve. The nerve anatomically is said to end when it reaches the mental nerve. It has two terminal branches, the mental nerve which comes out the mental foramen and the incisive nerve which stays in the bone. Here's the long buccal nerve, the lingual nerve, and the inferior alveolar nerve entering the mandibular foramen. This is your deposition site. This represents the nerve in the mandibular canal. Notice that the syringe is lateral to that lingual nerve. This is the area served by the IA nerve. That means when you give an IA block, the patient should not be able to feel the pulp from the central on that side all the way to the last molar present. They also will not be able to feel the buccal tissues except for, this is kind of misleading, they shouldn't they should still be able to feel the buccal tissues here because that would be the long buccal nerve. If you block the IA and the lingual at the same time, they won't be able to feel the lingual tissues either. The inferior alveolar nerve gives off a dental plexus to the mandibular molars and this says to the second premolars. This is an area of controversy. As I mentioned, anatomically this nerve ends at the mental foramen. So the location of the mental foramen is what determines where the inferior alveolar nerve technically ends. It is sending information from the pulp of any tooth supplied by a dental plexus of this nerve and the buccal tissues except for the molars which is supplied by the long buccal nerve. So here's the inferior alveolar nerve. This is a dental plexus for the third molar, the second molar, the first molar, the second premolar. If the mental foramen is located between these two, then it's kind of splitting hairs to say, does the IA nerve supply information from the premolars and molars, or does this technically become the incisive nerve? When we give anesthesia, it doesn't really matter. We have only two places where we can get access to the nerve supply or the dental plexus for our mandibular teeth. That is either at the mental foramen or the mandibular foramen. If we block at the mandibular foramen, information from the incisive nerve, the mental nerve, and the IA nerve are not going to get beyond our roadblock. 
if we block at the mental foramen right here, this is where we set up our roadblock, so information from the incisive nerve or mental nerve will not get by us. The patient will still be able to feel anything that is posterior to where we set up our roadblock. So if we set up our roadblock here, the patient will still be able to feel these teeth and the buccal soft tissues, as well as the lingual of any of these teeth because we haven't blocked the lingual nerve. As I mentioned, the mental nerve exits at the mental foramen. So take note of the fact that I'm using the word exit. If a nerve exits a foramen, that means it's headed for soft tissues only. The soft tissues we're talking about are the skin of the chin and the skin and mucous membranes of the lower lip. So when we block at the mental nerve, the patient will not be able to feel the incisors and perhaps one or both of the premolars, the soft tissues here, and the inside of their lower lip and the skin of their chin. They'll still be able to feel back here. They'll still be able to feel on the lingual. The incisive nerve is that part of the nerve that remains within the bone and sends a dental plexus up to the centrals, laterals, canine, and perhaps first premolar, depending again on where that mental foramen is located. Here's the mental foramen. This is the zone of anesthesia provided by a mental or incisive nerve block. You'll be learning the difference between a mental block and an incisive block. When we block the mental, we don't force a lot of anesthetic in here to get to the bone. We're just getting soft tissue anesthesia. When we give an incisive block, we are trying to force the anesthetic inside that foramen to actually block the nerve inside the bone. So to recap the mandibular nerve supply, when we're looking to anesthetize teeth, we're looking for something that has the word alveola in it. We're looking for our mandible, so it's inferior alveolar nerve. Uh, inferior alveolar nerve. The two branches of that nerve are the incisive nerve, which supplies information from the anterior teeth, and the mental nerve, which supplies soft tissues from the mental foramen to the midline. The lingual nerve, which supplies information from the lingual gingiva, and the long buccal nerve, which supplies information from the buccal gingiva in the molar region. The mylohyoid nerve is the only efferent or motor nerve from the posterior division. It comes off the mandibular nerve just posterior to the point at which the IA nerve enters the mandible. So this is the mylohyoid nerve right here. It runs in that mylohyoid groove and is headed down toward the floor of the mouth. In some individuals, the mylohyoid nerve actually has accessory nerves that enter the mandible and provide information from some of the posterior teeth. This is the chart that shows you the branches of the mandibular nerve, which leaves the skull through the foramen ovale. The branches of the common trunk are the meningeal and the medial pterygoid. The anterior division contains the deep temporal, masseteric, and lateral pterygoid. So these four nerves right here are supplying motor information to move the muscles of mastication. The anterior division also has the sensory long buccal branch, which provides information from the buccal gingiva of our mandibular molars. And lastly, the posterior division, which has the sensory branch of the auriculotemporal, the lingual branch, which provides information from our lingual gingiva and the body or anterior two-thirds of our tongue, the mylohyoid branch, which is motor, and lastly, the inferior alveolar branch. The inferior alveolar branch has two branches of its own, mental and incisive. So you can block just the mental or the mental and the incisive. Or you can block the inferior alveolar, which means you've also blocked the mental and the incisive. Here's again a schematic of the mandibular division. This is a chart that I've also posted as a Word document on the Blackboard site. It's sort of a recap in a different format. I've given you the teeth, the nerve. When it says dental nerve, this is the nerve that provides information from the pulp chamber, the nerve that provides information from the buccal soft tissues and lingual soft tissues. So again, you will notice on the maxilla, if it provides information from the pulp, it is also providing information from the buccal of the tooth. And it will say alveolar. If it is 
providing information from the lingual or palatal surfaces of our maxilla, it is going to have the word palatine in it. The posterior teeth are from the greater palatine, and the anterior teeth are from the nasopalatine. On the mandible, again, we're looking for the word alveolar if we're talking about the dental nerve. In this case, the anteriors are from the incisive, but the incisive is a branch of the IA. For the molars, it's the long buccal nerve for buccal gingiva. For the rest of the teeth, it's the IA nerve or the incisive nerve. For all of our teeth on the mandible, it's the lingual nerve. The last nerve to discuss is the facial nerve or cranial nerve 7, which is also a mixed nerve that leaves the skull through the stylomastoid foramen. This nerve has a motor component which moves the muscles of facial expression. Very important for you to recognize. If the patient should get anesthesia of the facial nerve, they will not be able to move the muscles of facial expression. It also does some things you see listed here which really aren't important for you to understand for anesthesia, but this last one is. It provides our ability to taste things from the anterior two-thirds of our tongue. And again, this is the corda tympani nerve that does that. <clears throat> These are the five motor branches of the temporal nerve. This is the parotid gland. These are those five branches passing down from the stylomastoid foramen and running through the parotid gland. I'll show you the significance of this in just a moment. But just keep in mind, these are branches that are trying to go to these muscles to make them move. So the signal is coming from the brain to the muscles. They happen to anatomically pass through the parotid gland. The facial nerve also has a branch called the greater, petro greater petrosal, which has both sensory and motor fibers and isn't extremely important to anesthesia. But this branch is. The corda tympani branch has fibers that bring messages to the sublingual and submandibular salivary glands, telling them to release saliva into the mouth. But it also has specialized sensory fibers that provide sensory information from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. That is, they allow us to taste whatever is on the body of our tongue. It just so happens, as I mentioned earlier, that these fibers are physically intertwined with the lingual nerve. So when we block the lingual nerve, we can neither feel nor taste from that side of our tongue. This is the caution you must remember. As I mentioned just a few moments ago, the fibers from the facial nerve run through the parotid gland on their way to the muscles of facial expression. It just so happens that the parotid gland wraps itself around the back part of the mandible. And it is possible, if we direct our needle in a two-posterior direction when giving an IA block, we miss the mandible, go too far backwards, and put our anesthesia into the parotid gland. That can potentially anesthetize the facial nerve fibers and cause temporary facial paralysis in our patients. So again, here's the parotid gland. It runs all the way down to the angle of the mandible and wraps itself around the back part of the mandible like this. These are the fibers running down through that gland on their way to move these muscles. This may help you understand it just a little bit better. You're looking at a section here. This is the masseter muscle. This is the ramus of the mandible. The inferior alveolar nerve, the sphenomandibular ligament, the lingual nerve, the pterygomandibular raphe that I mentioned earlier was a critical landmark that we always had to remain lateral to. In other words, that raffe is always or should always be closer to our patient's midline than the entrance point of our anesthetic syringe. That's for a couple of different reasons. If we enter that and go in a medial direction, we are going to enter the medial pterygoid muscle and could provide some trismus or inability to relax this muscle, in which case the patient can't open their mouth very wide. The other thing that can happen is if we are aiming our syringe barrel this way, we can bump, <coughs> excuse me, bump into the mandible prematurely. That means our anesthetic gets placed too far away from the inferior alveolar nerve and our block is not successful. If we don't come into contact with the bone before depositing the anesthetic, we don't know if we're in this vicinity. We could be going by that inferior alveolar nerve altogether and depositing our solution way back here. 
into the parotid gland, where it will diffuse across the parotid gland and block the facial nerve, could cause temporary paralysis of some of our patient's facial muscles. This ends the presentation on anatomical considerations of local anesthesia. As I mentioned, um, there are several documents on the Blackboard site that you can download to help you. And I will be conducting two live one-hour chats. Those times will be posted on the Blackboard site. I'll be available to answer your questions online. I look forward to meeting you all at the clinical portion of the program.